We've talked about doing inference for a slope, both a confidence interval and a hypothesis test. And now we want to do a little bit of assessment to see how appropriate it is to use the model. Um, so there's another statistic that we haven't talked about yet, which is R squared. Um, it's called the coefficient of determination. I don't exactly know why it's called that, um, but it's the proportion of variability in the response that can be explained by the model with the explanatory variable. It's always between zero and one, and bigger values mean more of the variability is explained. So that's usually a better thing. You want a larger R squared value. Um, and it really depends on the context of the data, how big is good enough. If you have something like earthquakes, um, if you could explain 10% of the variability in when earthquakes occur, that would probably be pretty good. For a lot of scientific purposes, you need an R squared that is closer to 0.8 or 0.9 in order to be considered a good model. Um, and for simple linear regression, which is all we're doing in this class, that's when we just have one predictor, you can find R squared, big R squared, the coefficient of determination by squaring the correlation. So um, for simple linear regression, uh, R squared, the coefficient of determination is equal to little r, which is correlation squared. So you can just take the correlation and square it. So let's think about that with our rail trail example. Um, the correlation between volume and average temperature is 0 0.43. And then we could compute the value of R squared, which would be equal to little r squared, which is 0 0.43 squared, which is 0 0.1849. So that is the value of our R squared. Um, and then the question is, how do we interpret it? Uh, we say, um, 18.5% of the variability in volume on the rail trail can be explained by the model using average temp. So is that good or bad? I don't know. Um, explaining 18% of the variability seems decent to me. We're not considering things like, is it a weekday or a weekend or uh, what season it is? Is it a holiday? I think that sounds all right to me. And much like other uh, inferential or model uh, related tasks that we've done, this is something that we could confirm uh, using technology. So when you do regression in R, you're given the R squared value maybe a little bit different. Um, R is using a slightly different formula than we are, uh, but it's about the same. So they found the R squared of 18.2% of variability being explained. All right, the last piece of this is that um, if you're going to do regression and you're going to do inference about it, you need some conditions. So when we were doing inference for one proportion, we were checking the conditions NP greater than 10 and N times one minus P greater than 10. And when we did inference for a single mean, we were checking N greater than or equal to 30. So when you do inference for regression, there are four conditions um, and they're more complicated. We're not gonna talk in super detail about all of these in this class. If you wanna learn more about this stuff, you could take a full class on regression um, like STAT 320, uh, which focuses just on that. So there's a little mnemonic device that helps you remember the four conditions. It's L-I-N-E, and that stands for linearity, independence, normality, and equality of variance. So I'm gonna show you uh, what each of those conditions means. So the first one is linearity. If you're going to use a linear model, the data needs to look linear. So in this case, I have this straight blue line, um, which would be the line of best fit if we use linear regression. But when I look at the data, it actually looks like something curved would fit better. And so this is a violation of the linearity condition. So when you are gonna do uh, inference, you need to plot your data first to make sure that it looks linear. The next condition is independence, and I call this the thinking condition. 
because there are no plots that will help you assess whether it is met or not. And you want to make sure that observations are independent from one another. So that's basically rows in your data set. You want to make sure that each row is independent from each other row. So if you thought about taking a survey and you went up to a group of friends and you asked them, you know, what's your opinion on this topic? You asked the first person, then you asked the second person, then you asked the third person, they all got to hear each other's answers. Their answers might not be independent from one another. Maybe the peer pressure of hearing your friends respond would change uh, your response. So let's say a survey where you ask multiple friends. in a group, that would be a violation of this condition. The other really common violations of this condition are where observations are spatial units or where observations are units of time. So when I say spatial units, I mean things like states or counties or zip codes. So if every row in your data set is one of the 50 states, um, then you can't think that those things are independent from one another. Probably what's going on in North Dakota is gonna be related to what's going on in South Dakota is related to what's going on in Minnesota. So if you have spatial units, those observations are not independent from one another. The same thing with units of time, uh, by which I mean if it's like hours or days or weeks or years, uh, what's going on today you don't think is going to be that different from what's going on tomorrow and the next day. Um, there's some continuity over time. So those are both violations of this condition. Um, the place where usually the condition is upheld is if it is a random experiment, then the researchers try to make sure that the condition is upheld and that each of the observations are independent from The normality condition um, we're not considering in this class, but uh, it has to do with the residuals being normally distributed. Um, and in this case, the residuals are not normally distributed. There are fewer residuals up in the top and more uh, dense residuals down in the bottom. And then the last condition is equality of variance. And this is one that I am going to have you think about. Um, so when you think about equality of variance, you're again gonna look at the plot and you wanna make sure um, you want the band of residuals to uh, have equality of variance. And this plot again is a violation. And that's because if we look at the band of residuals, down here we have a really narrow band of residuals. The model is doing a really good job of predicting those points. When we get out here, we have a wider band of residuals. Um, and then when we get to the very top, we have an extremely wide band of residuals. So this is kind of a fan shape. And this is one of the classic ways that you can see that this um, condition is being violated. So I'll note that this is not a violation of the linearity condition. I don't see anything that would fit this data better than a straight line. I don't see a curve in the data that it would fit better. I don't see anything you know, crazy like that, but the equality of variance condition is being violated. So here is an example that is actually a good example of all the conditions. So I've got my L, I, and E conditions, um, linearity, uh, I don't see anything um, curved that would fit the data better than a line, so linearity is upheld. Independence, I'll just tell you, uh, I don't have any context for this data, but the observations are independent from one another. Normality, uh, this is not something that we're going to concern ourselves with this class, but these are normally distributed. And then equality of variance has to do with the band of residuals, and it looks about the same width here as it looks here as it looks here. So that condition is upheld.